praise you for your word, which is the truth, and we receive your word this night, being written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We thank you that you are open our understanding to the truth as we take hold of the word, and we thank you that it will produce much fruit in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated, if you would. Tonight, we are going to continue to share with you what we began to talk about on Sunday night, but we're going to cover from a different aspect. On Sunday night, we talked to you about understanding the blood of Jesus. We talked about the blood in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And we pointed out at the end about the unscriptural traditions that have gone forth regarding the blood of Jesus. And we're going to talk about that more in depth tonight. It is important because of the fact that we need to understand how the blood of Jesus is applied in our life. And we must understand that we cannot follow the traditions of men, even though they've been widely accepted throughout the body of Christ. In Exodus chapter 12, in verse 3, he says, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month you shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. What were they to do? The lamb was to be without blemish. This is all type of and pointing towards Jesus, who was the lamb that was going to go to the cross to bear away the sin of the world. And they had to keep it up to the 14th day of the same month. And then that's exactly what happened to Jesus, the Passover lamb on the very day of Passover when he was made sin. And then they would take of the blood and they would strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they were shall eat, it says. That shows you the blood was put on the upper post, as it says, and on the side post. That makes it in a form of like a cross, pointing towards the cross where Jesus was going to be made sin and his blood was going to be shed in order to accomplish the redemption, to pay the price for man's sins, the ransom price, which the life of the flesh is in the blood as he gave his life. Also, his blood was later going to be taken to the mercy seat in heaven and to put on the mercy seat, ratifying the new covenant in his blood. So we see that the blood was put. And what were they to do? They were supposed to, as they were Take eating the lamb, which is all a type of us taking Jesus into us. If you eat something, it comes into you, and we're to take Jesus into us. We get born again. He said, you're going to do it with your loins girded, your shoes on, your feet, your staff in your hand. You shall eat it. It's the Lord's Passover. They were going to get ready to leave. What were they going to do? They were going to leave Egypt. That's all a type of the fact that when you and I get born again, well, you and I are to leave spiritual Egypt, which is what? Egypt is a type of the world. We must come out of the ways of the world and walk in the ways of God, in the ways of the Spirit. Then he says what he's going to do. I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. What was happening here? God was bringing judgment on Pharaoh, on Egypt, on all the gods of Egypt and he was going to smite all of the firstborn. What did the children of Israel need to do? They had to put the blood, not on themselves, but on the upper post and on the side post, which was pointing towards what Jesus would do for us. But at the same time, the blood, when God saw the blood, he would pass over and not bring judgment upon them. The point being is this was God's judgment coming upon him, and the blood protected him from what? from God's judgment, not from the enemy, not from anything that the enemy was doing. It was protecting him from God's judgment. That is an important point. In Exodus chapter 24, we're going to be looking at some scriptures we looked at that are important for us to really grab hold of so we understand about the unscriptural traditions concerning the blood of Jesus which need to be eliminated. Exodus 24 verse 7. This is talking about Moses. He took the book of the covenant and he read in the audience of the people and they said, all that the Lord has said will we do and be obedient. The book of the covenant here, what they read was the word of God. We hear the word of God today. And as we hear the word of God, what are we to do? We're to respond to it by doing it and being obedient to the things that God tells us to do. Then what happened? And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. In other words, first they heard the word, did the word, obedient to it. The result of them doing the word, walking in the word, obeying the word was the blood was poured upon them. Moses is a type of Christ. 
Who did something with the blood? It was Moses, which again is a type of Christ. Who deals with the blood of Jesus? Jesus does, not the people. And why was the blood poured upon them? Because they heard the word, they did the word, they were obedient to the word. And that is an important point. Over in 1 Peter, we see this same thing pointed out. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. It speaks of the elect, which are the ones that are chosen, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit. When we get a brand new spirit and we're born again, we're now, our spirit is not only righteous before him, but it's also been sanctified, made holy, and consecrated unto him. We have a brand new spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ. And now we're born again, what are we to do? Unto obedience, obedience to what? The word of God. And sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ is applied to those who are obedient to the word. What comes first? Obedience to the word. What comes second? The sprinkling of the blood. The point is this. The blood of Jesus is applied to those who are obedient to the word as they hear and they do the word of God. We want to look at another scripture in the Old Testament that we looked at in Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2, here's where Joshua the son of Nun what sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into the harlot's house and named Rahab and lodged there. It was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered in thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. Well, what did Rahab do? Rahab ended up hiding the men. And we see, as he was hiding the men, this in chapter 2, go back to verse 18, that is. Here, after they had hid the men, this is what they said to her. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, which thou dost let us down by. What's that pointing towards? The fact that the blood being shown that they would then be protected from God's judgment that was going to come upon the city of Jericho. So the line of scarlet thread in the window, which you let us down by, you'll bring your father, your mother, your brethren, all the father's household were come, are going to be home unto thee. And he says, whosoever shall go out of the doors of the house in the street, his blood will be upon his head and will be guiltless. But whosoever shall be with thee in the house, his blood will be on our head, on our head if any hand be upon him. Therefore, of course, she sent him away, they departed, and she bound the scarlet line in the window, as she was supposed to. Then we come over to chapter 6. What happened when the children of Israel came to take Jericho? It says here in Joshua 6, 17, that the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein, to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. So this was God's judgment coming upon this city. In verse 25, it says, Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive and her father's household and all that she had. And she dwelleth in Israel even to this day because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. They saw the scarlet thread. What was going on here? God's judgment was coming upon Jericho. What was necessary to avoid God's judgment? There had to be the scarlet thread showing pointing towards the blood. When God saw the blood then, he would not bring judgment upon them. And that is important that we understand that God wants us to have the blood applied so that we do not see judgment. Notice, it did not defend them from the enemy. It defended them from God's judgment because the blood all has to do with your relationship with God. And that is an important point. We want to look at some scriptures also that we looked at just to drive this point home about what the blood does involving our relationship with God. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, here it speaks of how thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. They were redeemed to God by the blood. Through the blood of Jesus, we've been redeemed. That means we've been purchased. We have now been redeemed and we belong unto the Lord. We see a scripture in Colossians, in chapter 1, over here in verse 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Redemption has brought forth a remission or a forgiveness of sins. 
So our sins are washed away. We see another thing that the blood did. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, we now have peace with God through the blood. By him to reconcile all things unto himself. So peace and reconciliation to God came through the blood of Jesus. We also see Acts chapter 20, over here in verse 28. Acts 20, verse 28. Here he speaks about how, the, the, about feeding the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Again, the blood purchased the church. It all has to do with relationship between God and man and the church, those who are believers. We see over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, in verse 19, it speaks of this. What, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you and which you have of God, and you are not your own? We don't belong to ourselves any longer. Why? For you are bought with a price. Jesus paid the price, the ransom price, with his life, pouring out the blood, which was the ransom price that purchased you and I. We're bought with a price. That therefore we belong unto the Lord. It all the blood has to do with relationship with God. Romans chapter 5 tells us something else in verse 9. Much more than being now justified or declared righteous by his blood, we're saved from wrath through him. When we are righteous, we are righteous with him, and then we'll be saved from God's wrath, is what that's talking about. We see another scripture over in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. Here he speaks of the fact that they were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise. Uh, they were having no hope without God in the world. But he says, now in Christ Jesus, for all those that are born again, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Now we have come nigh unto him because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Again, it has to do with our relationship with God. We see in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. We can enter into the holiest in the presence of God because of the blood of Jesus. It all has to do with relationship with him. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 indicates, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Our sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus. What else has the blood done for us in our relationship with God? Hebrews chapter 9, over here in verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? God, the blood of Jesus purges your conscience from dead works so that you can serve God. Again, this all has to do with relationship. So we see the blood is what has redeemed us, it's washed us from our sins. We've had forgiveness of sins. We now have peace with God and reconciliation to Him. We've been purchased, we're bought, we belong to the Lord. We've now been declared righteous as we receive a brand new spirit. We're brought, now brought nigh to Him, to the covenants of promise. We have boldness to enter into the very presence of God and our conscience now has been purged so that we can serve God. This is all talking about our relationship with God. If we do sin, we are affecting our relationship with God. He says in Romans chapter 10, or Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, quite a statement. If we sin willfully, means we know what we're doing, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. But what's going to happen? Certain fearful looking for of judgment, fire indignation, which will devour the adversaries. He even says, that he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Quite a penalty. Now he says of how much sore punishment. This is judgment that would come upon us in the New Testament. Suppose you shall he be thought worthy who hath done three things when you sin willfully. You are trodden underfoot the Son of God, whether you realize it or not, counting the blood of the covenant where you were sanctified as an unholy thing, and you do despite, which means insult unto the Spirit of grace. Quite a statement. When you sin willfully, you 
from God, what God says, you're trodden underfoot the Son of God, you're counting the blood of the covenant a holy thing, and you're doing insult unto the Spirit of grace. That's why we've got to turn away from all areas of sin in our life. In Hebrews chapter 13, we see something else about what the blood does, God does through the blood co a covenant. Hebrews 13, 20, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do His will. God will make you perfect to, in every work to do His will. Working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight. See, God's going to be able to work in you when you are walking in His ways and you are the sheep following the shepherd under the the covenant relationship and the blood having been applied because you're walking in his ways. Now, how is the blood of Jesus applied to believers? We've already seen it always involves relationship with God. It has nothing to do with dealing with the enemy. It has all to do with relationship with God. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, we see one of the ways that the blood of Jesus is applied. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, that's our part, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What happens when we sin? Well, the Bible talks about, even over in 1 John chapter 5, in verse 17, that all unrighteousness is sin. Whenever we sin, we have committed unrighteousness. So what do we need to do? We've got to get cleansed from it. How are we going to get cleansed from it? By confessing our sins unto Him. When we do so, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood of Jesus Christ applied by the Lord will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How else is the blood of Jesus applied? This is when you've sinned. How about it when you're not walking in sin? Is the blood still applied? Yes, it is. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 says, If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. The word cleanseth is a word which when we look up the tense, voice, and mood of the verbs, which are very important to understand what's being said, this is a present tense verb. The present tense in the Greek means continuous, ongoing, repeated action. In other words, this would say literally, the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us continually in an ongoing manner from all sin. In other words, it keeps you cleansed. So what's the condition here? If we walk in the light. How do we walk in the light? When we walk in line with His Word. When you walk in line with God's Word, then the blood of Jesus Christ is continually applied towards you of having been cleansed from all sin. So, how is the blood applied? It's applied when we confess our sins, receive forgiveness, cleansing from all unrighteousness, and or when we walk in the light so that the blood will continually be applied for us in an ongoing manner, keeping us cleansed, of course, showing that we are cleansed from all sin. That is very important to understand. Now tonight, we're going to talk about unscriptural traditions concerning the blood of Jesus. And we pointed out that pleading the blood which is common throughout the body of Christ, is an unscriptural tradition. It is man trying to do something with the blood which he cannot do. Who is the one who applies the blood? It is always the Lord. Do you and I have anything to do with the blood? No. Moses is the one who applied the blood, a type of Christ, and the Lord is the one who applies the blood to us when we meet the conditions. So all the teaching about pleading the blood is unscriptural, as you will see. Now, unscriptural traditions that we're going to address are important. And we've, what I'm going to be doing is taking statements from other teachers, tapes, books, whatever type of, where they brought forth information. We're not mentioning people's names. We're not interested in, in downing people in any means. But we are interested in finding out whether they say, what they say is in line with the truth or not. These are quotes from what they say. One of the statements is that the blood of Jesus is an offensive weapon against the devil. Is the blood of Jesus an offensive weapon against the devil? The answer is no. It is not a weapon against the devil. The blood has to do with our relationship with God. It is not used against the enemy. One of the ways we know is 
What do we put on for warfare? We put on the whole armor of God, don't we? When we put on the whole armor of God, it begins to talk about the parts of the armor of God. Is the blood of Jesus mentioned in the armor of God? No. It, ta it always ha all has to do with the Word. Loins gored about with the truth, which is the Word. Having on the breast breastplate of righteousness, that's the Word in our heart. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, that's the, the Word to direct our steps. Above all, taking the shield of faith, where we quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, that's the Word of God that we speak to deal with the enemy's attacks, coming to get temptations. Take the helmet of salvation, that's the Word in our mind. Helmet covers your mind. The sword of the Spirit, which is the rhema, the word here is rhema, spoken word of God, where we use the word to smite the enemy, that's our sword against the enemy, and we pray with all manner of prayer. Do you see the blood of Jesus listed anywhere in the armor of God? No. Is it a weapon against the, an offensive weapon against the enemy? No. What do we see that is the weapons that we use against the enemy? We use the word. We also use the name of Jesus. What do we see happen in the book of Acts? In the book of Acts, when they went and Peter and John ministered to this man who got healed, he said in Acts 3, 6, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He said in the name, in the name of Jesus. That's what caused him to be able to be raised up. And of course, the result was he took him by the right hand, lifted him up, immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Well, the devil had this guy bound. And now he was healed. How? Through the name of Jesus as he spoke forth. In fact, we see down in verse 16. He said, His name through faith in his name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. In fact, later, when he was coming before all those ones that were against him, the Sanhedrin and all the religious leaders, it says in Acts 4, 7, when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power, by what name have you done this? They realized the fact that he was doing this marvelous work, mighty work, and they want to know, how are you doing this? And of course, it was through the name of Jesus. In fact, in verse 17, this is what they said. They said, if it, that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. Otherwise, the name is what, don't speak in this name, the name is what's doing things against the enemy. They called them and commanded them not to speak or at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. They forbid it. The name of Jesus is how the works are being done as we act upon the Word of God. Philip, who preached the gospel to those at Samaria, it says in verse, chapter 8, verse 12, when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus. And he had done signs and wonders and miracles as he was ministering to them. It was the name of Jesus. How did Paul cast the demon out of this one woman who was being used of the enemy to deceive the people as this, this, this spirit of divination? Acts 18, he said, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. The name was used to destroy the works of the enemy. We see the same thing over in Acts 19 that these Jewish vagabond Jews recognized that it was the name of Jesus that was doing all this, not the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus. And so what they do? They certain vagabond Jews, they took up to call over them which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And of course they were trying to cast out the demons, but they weren't born again. And the evil spirit says, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And of course what was the result? The man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on him, overcame and prevailed against them, so they fled out of the house naked and wounded. You can't cast out the demon if you're not right with God. The demons know who's right with God and who's not right with God. But the name of the Lord was magnified because of this. <coughs> Verse 17, this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling in Ephesus. Fear fell, fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. We must understand that the works of God are being done in the name of Jesus. How else are, what else is our offensive weapon against the enemy? We do things by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Matthew chapter 12, in verse 28, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, how did, this is Jesus, how did he cast out the demons? By the Spirit of God. It was by the power of the Holy Spirit. We even see in Acts chapter 10, it makes a summary statement regarding what God 
did, of course, through Jesus Christ. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost with power, went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. The anointing of the Holy Spirit was upon him. And the power of God through the Word resident in him. So how was everything done? All the works of God were done through the Word of God, through the name of Jesus, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Was the blood involved in anything as an offensive weapon against the enemy? No, not at all. Is the blood a defensive weapon against the enemy? That's another statement we'll say. The blood is a defensive weapon against the enemy. No, we've already seen that the blood all has to do with our relationship with God. It has nothing to do with anything about defending us. Now, people say, what about Revelation chapter 12, verse 11? We're talking about using the blood as an, a weapon against the enemy. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, it looks like maybe that there's something here about the blood used against the enemy. But notice what it says. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and loved not their lives unto the death. What is this talking about? First of all, we've got to look at it in the context. It begins with and. And ties together what was preceding with what is being said. And it talks about they overcame him. Who's it talking about? Satan by the blood of the Lamb. Well, what happened here? Verse 10 tells us, it speaks of the accuser of the brethren, who is going to be cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Who's the accuser of the brethren? Satan. What was he doing? Accusing them of, their, of sins. Accusing them of, of committing sins. That was Satan's accusation against them. Satan's accusation against them, did it prevail? No. They overcame him in what way? His accusations. By the blood of the Lamb. Why? Because of the fact that Remember, the blood of Jesus is cleansed, keeps us cleansed when we walk in the light as he is in the light. In other words, the blood was applied by Jesus because their accusations were groundless and they were not successful. The blood was not a weapon against the devil. The blood had to do with relationship with God so that we were right with God, so the blood of Jesus would be cleansed so that their accusations against God, before God against believers would not be successful. So it says they overcame by the blood of the Lamb that was applied because they were walking in the way of the Word, and by the word of their testimony, which shows that they were walking in the Word of God. Notice, it didn't stop the devil's works because it says they love not their lives unto the death. That means there are going to be some people that are going to be martyred, that are going to suffer death at these times. So the point is that the blood is not a defensive weapon against the devil at all. Instead, it is involving our relationship with God so that Satan's accusations will not be successful. It will stop his accusations because we're right with God, but does it stop his works? It does not stop his works at all. That's an important point. How do we deal with Satan and his, his attacks coming against us as well? Just as how do they overcome them? Because of the word of their testimony, which showed the fact that they were walking in line with the word. How else do we overcome them? In Ephesians chapter 6, in verse 16, it says this, Above all, taking the shield of faith, we're able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. All right? The shield of faith, we can quench his fiery darts. What's that talking about? Holding up the word against the enemy when he would attack. What do we see? What happened? Jesus is our example. In Matthew chapter 4, how did Jesus defeat Satan's attacks against him? He said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. How did he get rid of the next temptation? It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. How about the temptation after that? He said, It is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. The point being is that we overcome Satan's accusations and any attacks through the word of God, that we're walking in, or by speaking the Word of God, it is written to deal successfully with them. We overcome the accusations by the blood of the Lamb because the blood's been applied, because we've confessed our sins and or walk in line with the Word, and by the Word of our testimony that shows the fact that we are walking in line with the Word of God. If we weren't, then Satan's accusations would be successful against us, but they're not when we're walking right. And that's what it's talking about in Revelation 12, 11. The next thing that people say, and these are quotes again, 
They see, say that we need to remind Satan about the blood when they're going into warfare against him. Did anybody ever remind Satan about the blood any place in the scriptures? No, it's not in the Bible whatsoever. Are we ever directed in the Bible to remind Satan about the blood? No, it's a false tradition. Another thing they say is, well, we need to cover ourselves with the blood of Jesus. Many people teach that. Do we need to cover ourselves with the blood of Jesus? Is there any scripture in the Bible that tells us to cover ourselves with the blood of Jesus? No. Many people cover themselves, their loved ones, their possessions with the blood of Jesus. Is it scriptural? Absolutely not. We don't touch the blood. Who applies the blood? Jesus does. When? When we walk in the light as he is in the light, or when we have confessed our sins and received forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteous. Notice it's automatically applied by Jesus when we meet the conditions. We do nothing with the blood whatsoever. Another point, thing that people say is, well, the blood put on the doorposts in Exodus 12, that was put on there for, for to cleanse them. No, the blood didn't have, it wasn't applied to them. It was applied simply as a pointing towards the cross and what Jesus would do in order to protect them from God's judgment that was coming. It had nothing to do with protecting them from the enemy and nothing to do with cleansing them whatsoever. Other people say, well, since the blood was applied to the doorpost of the house, shouldn't we apply the blood of Jesus to our house and possessions daily? Well, the answer is no. After that, did they, were they ever instructed to put the blood on their house, on their doorpost, on anything in their house ever in the entire Old Testament? Never. Not one time. Why? Because we don't do anything with the blood. It's all, that one time was all pointing towards the cross and what Jesus was going to do and the fact that when he, Jesus, when God saw the blood, it would protect them from God's judgment that was going to come upon them. How do we deal with the enemy's attacks? We deal with him through the word of God, the name of Jesus, by the spirit of God and using the authority that's been given unto us. Now, do we plead the blood of Jesus? Is the term pleading the blood anywhere in the Bible? It's not there. There's no scripture on it. The word plead is used in the Bible 39 times in the Old Testament. It's never found in the New Testament. The Hebrew words, there's four different Hebrew words that are translated plead. They're very similar. They all speak of pleading a particular cause. And the general meaning of it is to conduct a, to be able to, uh, defend or co conduct a legal case to prove, defend, or maintain a cause before a judge. It's like a legal term. For example, we see this over in uh, 1 Sa Samuel, chapter 24, about talking about this word plead. Use 39 times, and here's some examples. Here's one case where it's translated, plead my cause. The Lord therefore be judge, and judge between me and thee, and see, and plead my cause, and deliver me out of thine hand. So he's coming for the Lord to deliver him, and he's pleading his cause. We also see a scripture over in Psalms 35, Psalms 35, verse 1. And these are just a few of the cases. Plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. Fight against them that fight against me. It's all, again, looking to the Lord to defend them against the enemies that were coming against them. We also see that this has been translated as pleaded the cause, another place. And we're just taking the time to look at a few of these scriptures so you understand about what pleading was all about in the Word of God in the Old Testament era. 1 Samuel 25, 39. Here he talks about how blessed be the Lord which hath pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and hath kept his servant from evil. He pleaded the cause so he would be protected from that. It all had to do with going to the Lord and looking to him to plead the cause. Another case we see is over in Psalms, Psalms 74. And these are just a few of the examples that are there in the Old Testament. In verse 22, he says this, Psalm 74, 22. Arise, O God, plead thine, own, plead thine own cause. Remember how the foolish man reproacheth thee daily. Again, looking for God to plead the cause to defend against the enemy. We see a case over in Proverbs, chapter 22, 23. And you look here and it says, For the Lord will plead their cause and spoil the soul of those who spoil them. Again, 
And every single case has to do with looking to the Lord from a legal standpoint to plead their cause to defend them. There is one case in the Bible where you and I are told, or they were told with God, to plead together. And this, again, is what you do in prayer, where they were bringing the Word of God. It says in Isaiah 43, 26, let, put me in remembrance, let us plead together. What are we bringing? The Word of God before Him. Declare thou that thou mayest be justified. As you bring the Word, then you'll be declared justified or righteous before the Lord. Pleading was always a legal pleading whereby the judge would deliver, keep him from evil, judge righteously, justify him, execute judgment against their enemy, do something in some aspect. In the New Testament, what do we see? In 1 John chapter 2, it speaks of the fact that Jesus has a ministry as our advocate. We see in 1 John 2, 1, My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate, or this is like one who stands by our side. It's like a heavenly attorney with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You see, the way it works is this. The Father is the judge. Jesus is our defense attorney. The prosecutor is the devil who's coming to accuse us. So when he tries to accuse us before the judge, and then Jesus, of course, what is he doing? He's declaring the law or the word, which is what you and I, the testimony of what we, his client, which is us, what we are walking in line with. Therefore, then the accusations are groundless. And so he cannot prevail in his accusations against us. Must understand that pleading all has to do with him getting an act, Satan trying to get some kind of accusation against us. And we're pleading the word, which always causes us to be right with God and to for his accusations to not be able to prevail against us. But again, what's the blood have to do with? It all has to do with relationship with God. Here's another, script, another point that people have made, and a scripture we want to look at over in Hebrews chapter 12. It says that when we plead the blood, this is what people assume, they say it pleads for us crying mercy from the mercy seat. Otherwise, we're supposed to plead the blood for the blood to do something and show forth mercy. Is that true? No. First of all, we don't plead the blood. The blood is already up there in heaven. It says in Hebrews 12, 24, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, the, to the blood of sprinkling, sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Abel's cried out for judgment. What does Jesus' blood speak of? It speaks of mercy. He has mercy. And by the way, is this something that we need to do to get it to speak? No. The word speaketh here shows that it is present tense, showing that it continually, ongoing manner, is speaking of mercy. In other words, the blood is always speaking of mercy. God's mercies are always ready. So, do we need to plead the blood in order to see the mercy be released? No, it's already there. All we've got to do is be sure that we're walking in line with the word so that then we can come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain, take hold of his mercy. We can take hold of it in prayer, as we see in Hebrews chapter 4, four verse 16. Here's another statement made. One songwriter says that the spirit answers to the blood. Sounds like a nice song, nice little phrase. Is it in the Bible? No, there's nothing in the Bible. What does the Spirit do? The Holy Spirit performs the Word. He's a performer of the Word. He responds to the Word of God. Nothing about the blood. And another thing people say, well, why do demons get stirred up when people start talking about the blood? Well, they don't like to hear about the blood because the blood is what brought forth the redemption. The blood is what was shed that brought forth the redemption of mankind, being reconciled to God, brought, brings forth righteousness, all these things. So it makes them mad. But does that get the demons out? No. Is that going to be an offensive weapon or even a defensive weapon against the enemy? No, never. Here's another statement by people. And again, these are quotes from their tapes, books, or uh, whatever st uh, teachings they've had. No wise Christian would ever dare to cast out demons without faith in the blood of Jesus, never without conscious pleading of the blood. Is that true? No. Do we see anybody ever casting out demons but with pleading the blood? Never. How are demons cast out? 
We already mentioned this, but we'll even look at another scripture beside the one we looked at. Mark 16, 17 tells us how we cast out demons. In my name shall they cast out devils. The name of Jesus is the means of authority. We don't do anything with the blood. Otherwise, people are, trying, are teaching things that are contrary. They're trying to teach that the blood is like a covering or a protection when, that they're do, putting upon themselves or upon their loved ones. It is not true. Who applies the blood? Jesus is the one who applies the blood. Here's another statement. One person's teacher says, by pleading the blood, that's the way people receive the Holy Spirit. That's his teaching. That's ridiculous. How did people receive the Holy Spirit? Anybody ever mention about the blood? Never. How do people receive the Holy Spirit in the New Testament? Well, we see in Acts chapter 8, verse 17, where this is where the Peter and John came down and they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost and they laid their hands on them and received the Holy Spirit through prayer and laying on of hands. Nothing about the blood. We also see another scripture over in Luke chapter, 13, 11, chapter 11, verse 13 which tells us another way we can receive the Holy Spirit. How much more should a Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? You come to Him to, in prayer to receive the Holy Spirit from Him. So it has nothing to do with the blood. Can you cover your loved ones with the blood? No. Can you cover any person with the blood? No. How is a person going to have the blood of Jesus applied towards them? By Jesus. When they walk in the light as He is in the light, and or when they confess their own sins and receive forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness. Remember, Jesus is the one who applies the blood. Never is it recorded that anybody covered themselves with the blood of Jesus whatsoever. Here's another one. Says Another teacher says, the blood of Jesus covers us because we put it there by faith. Do we do anything such as that? No, there's no scripture on that whatsoever. We don't do anything with the blood. Remember, the blood is where? It's on the mercy seat. Are we doing anything with it? No. It's there and it speaks of continual mercy and the Lord is the one who applies it when we meet the conditions of either walking in the light and or confessing our sins. So is there any scripture that ever tells us to plead the blood? That's what, when I've had people, and this, this has been such a prevailing teaching throughout the body of Christ. Almost everybody out there is doing it. You get a lot of persecution for this. When people have come and said, that they come against you on that, I give them, I say this, you give me chapter and verse that shows that you plead the blood in the, in the Bible and I'll tear up my books and I'll repent on the spot right before you. They can never do it. Not one person has ever been able to do it. Here's another person saying, when we plead the blood, is it a valid, is a valid a, a scriptural expression of our faith in that blood? No. What shows faith in the blood of Jesus? When, first of all, you receive Jesus because of what he did for you. If he, his blood was shed for uh, accomplishing the redemption, then you receive him as your personal Lord and Savior. What else shows the fact? If he's our Lord and Savior, we're going to walk in line with his word. Every time we walk in line with his word and be obedient, we are counting the blood as a holy thing. Remember, when we disobey, we're counting it as an unholy thing. We saw that scripture in Hebrews chapter 10. So how do we show the fact that we have faith in the blood? by receiving Jesus and being obedient to his word and doing the things that he says. Here's another statement. This is written in one man's book. He says, he admits that pleading the blood is not in the Bible. He admits it in his book. One of the only people I've ever seen admit it. But then he says, the, school, the phrase Sunday school is not in the Bible either. So, does that mean the fact that we can't have Sunday school? That's what he says. I can show it you in the book. It's ridiculous. Well, Sunday school is just a means whereby we can teach the Word of God. That is, how can you make a comparison like that? That was just a comparison because Sunday school is not in there. Then that implies the concept of having Sunday school, which we can have. You know, but, well, that means it must be okay you know, for, to go ahead and plead the blood, even though it's not in the Bible. And he even gives the scripture about the fact that, well, you know, we are increasing in knowledge, like we're getting extra knowledge. He uses the scripture over in Colossians chapter 1. In verse 10, and speaking about the fact that, well, you know, we're increasing in knowledge, like there's extra biblical knowledge beyond the Bible. Anytime anybody ever tells you, hey, we got some knowledge here beyond the Bible, run from them, get away from them immediately, because they're definitely telling you things that are wrong. The application of the blood is actively done by Jesus. 
It's passively received by us, not actively done by us, when we meet the conditions of walking in the light or having confessed our sins. Here's another one. Most people, a lot of them say, and well, I've heard this many times in books and tapes and so forth. They say that they ask God to cover themselves with the blood every day. Sounds like a great thing to do, you know? Just be sure you cover yourself with the blood every day. Has nothing to do with it. Is there any place in the Bible that says to do that? No. If this was such an important thing to do every day, it's got to be in the Bible at least once. It ought to be in the Bible 10, 20 times if it's something that you do daily, wouldn't it? You know? But it's not there one time. Did anybody ever pray to be covered with the blood of Jesus in Scripture? Never. Here's another statement they make. You cover yourselves with blood to appropriate all the benefits of the cross, such as your protection, your access, your forgiveness, your security, your redemption, reconciliation, and all that. Now, is that the way that we possess all those things? No. We don't have anything to do with that. How do we get forgiven? Confess our sins, receive forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness. That's nothing to do with what we do with the blood. How do we uh, get, be in the presence of God? You know, we praise and worship God, pray in tongues, sing unto Him, minister unto Him. How do we uh, get victory? They think this is how you get victory. No, we get victory through our faith, acting on the Word of God, using our authority, taking dominion over the devil, receiving the promises of God. How do we get cleansed? You know, the same way, by walking in the light and or confessing our sins. Again, these are all false traditions. Well, where does protection come? If we don't plead the blood of Jesus, how am I going to be protected? That's a good question. We want to know, how are we protected? And the answer is, we are protected by the angels. Because where is the blood in heaven? Where are the angels? They operate in heaven, but they also operate in earth. Where are you and I? We're not in heaven, we're on earth. So we need somebody or something that's on earth to protect us here where we are, where the enemies, the evil spirits, are trying to work against us here on earth where we are. Who protects us? The angels protect us. And we saw many scriptures on this. We'll just look at a few of these. Again, Exodus chapter 23. It's the angels that go before us. Exodus 23, 20, I'll send an angel before thee to keep thee or to guard thee in the way. The angels are going to guard you and bring you to the place which I prepared. Of course, you're to beware him, obey his voice, provoke him not. He'll not pardon your transgressions. My name is in him. If you indeed obey his voice and do all I speak, which would be obeying the word because that's what they bring forth, then I'll be an enemy to thy enemies and an adversary to thy adversaries. Who's protecting us? It is the angels that are protecting us. How about if we have the fear of God? What's going to happen then? Well, we see in Psalms 34, in verse 7, it says this, The angel of the Lord encamps round about them that fear him. You have the fear of God before you? You're walking in his ways, being obedient? The angel of the Lord will encamp round about you, and he will deliver you. It's the angels of God that minister for us. How about when you're going after the enemies? The angels are going to war, fight in the spirit against the, the enemies, the evil spirits. It even says here in Psalms 35, 5, let them be as chaff before the wind. Let the angel of the Lord chase them. Otherwise, the angels will go after them. Let their way be dark and slippery. Let the angel of the Lord persecute them. Angels will fight our battles against the enemies in the realm of the spirit. We see in Psalms 91, verse 11, what's it say there? He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee or guard thee in all thy ways. Who's protecting us? The angels are protecting us. How do we put our, well, let's look at a couple other scriptures before we do that. Isaiah is another place. Isaiah chapter 37, in verse 36, says this. Then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and four score and five thousand. That is a hundred and eighty-five thousand were smitten. And they arose early in the morning. Behold, they were all dead corpses. Who's fighting for us? The angels. Angels are out there fighting for us to smite the enemies. Who's the one? How did the three ch uh, Hebrew children get delivered? In Daniel chapter 3. We see over here, verse 28. He said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him. The angel delivered him. How about Daniel? When Daniel got thrown in the lion's den, how did he get protected? My God, 
Daniel 6.22, My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouth that they have not hurt for me. So again, the angels are the ones who delivered, delivered them, protected them, fought against the, the enemies. Angels are what does things. You see throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's always angels that are carrying things out. And that is an important point. Now, how are you going to put your angels in operation? First of all, you've got to realize, are angels to minister for you and, and, to, and to protect you? Of course they are. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14 says this about the angels. It's talking about the angels. We can see from verse 13. Verse 14 says, Are they, speaking of the angels, not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Who's the heirs of salvation? You and I are. And who ministers for us? The angels. Angels are servants that minister for you and for me. How are we going to put these angels in operation? In Psalms 103, down here in verse 20. Psalms 103, verse 20, it says, Bless the Lord, ye his angels that excel. The word excel actually means strong and mighty. That are strong and mighty in strength. Or this really means manifested power. Young's brings it out pretty well. Mighty in power. Angels are mighty in power. And what do they do? They do his commandments and they hearken to the voice of the word. What happens when you and I do his commandments and speak his word? The angels are going to go into operation to do his commandments, and they are going to hearken to the voice of the word. So as you're doing the word, the angels are going to go into operation. We see a scripture over here in Matthew chapter 26. Another way, you can pray to the Father to send angels to minister on your behalf. Matthew 26, 53, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels. This is Jesus speaking when Judas was going to bring the band of soldiers to take him, to take to the cross. And Jesus, of course, said, put up the sword there. And he said, Thinkest thou that I cannot pray to my Father? I could pray. The Father would send all these angels, and a legion was over 6,000 Roman soldiers. It was some 6,826 foot soldiers and horsemen combined. We're talking about 80-some thousand, if you multiply that out, of angels that could come on the scene. And apparently that's the number of angels that would need to deal with all that was working behind all these people. Therefore, you can put the angels in operation to protect you or fight for you or do battle in, against the enemies working through anybody else when you put the angels in operation. Angels protect us in the earth. So who's applying the blood? Jesus is. What causes it to be applied? When we walk in the light or when we confess our sins and receive forgiveness and cleansing. Do we do anything with the blood? No. We absolutely do nothing with it whatsoever. Here's another statement. This is by a man in his book. He says, the blood does not cover us automatically, but you have to ask for his protection with the blood. Do I have to ask the Lord to protect me with his blood? No. How do you know? We already saw that scripture. It says in 1 John 1, 7, and notice, what's your, you and my part? If we walk in the light, that's our part, right? As he is in the light. We have fellowship on one another, and then what is God's part? The blood of Jesus Christ continually cleanses from all sin, automatically because we met the condition. Do I have to ask him to do something? No. It's automatically done because we have met the condition. When we meet the condition, remember, God watches over his word to perform the word of the covenant. So our parts walk in the light. His part is applying the blood, and he is going to do that. Very important. Now, people have said, well, Satan can't touch me because I'm covered with the blood. Well, not so, just because you decide to put the blood on you. Satan cannot touch you because you're, why? Because you'd be walking in line with God's word, then the blood is going to be applied, not because of the fact that you try to cover yourself with the blood. I remember one person that said, well, I cover myself with the blood every morning, and I just had a car accident and all these problems. And I said, I say, they couldn't understand why that happened, how God, you know, God got the blame, you know, for why he allowed it to happen type of thing. I said, well, because that's an unscriptural thing. Of course, that took them back, and, but I explained it all to them, and they understood. Oh, I see that that wasn't, that wasn't what I should be doing. And I pointed out, who protects you? The angels. 
He said, have you been praying for your angels to go before you and keep you and protect you and guard you in all your ways as you're walking in line with the word? Well, no, I wasn't doing, I never knew that one because all I was taught was the other. I said, well, that's the problem. If you will put the angels in operation, you will be protected in how many of your ways? All of your ways, the Bible says. So we need to learn to do what he says, praise God. Remember, the blood's applied in heaven and the angels are here on earth. And where do we need protected? Here on earth, and they're the ones that do it. Here's another statement. The blood of Jesus against you, demon, to drive a demon out of someone. Do we do that? No. Nobody did that, they just cast it out. To speak the name of Jesus, command the thing to come out. Very simple. Here's another one. 1 Peter 2.24 says, By his stripes were healed, and they say this implies that Jesus' blood was shed for our healing. Not true. That's just simply how the sickness and disease was laid upon him through the stripes. How do we know that? Because of the fact, that otherwise they think that that's going to produce their healing. We see in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 17, what happened? It talks about what Jesus did, that he took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Isaiah even speaks of it as well in Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53, speaking about what Jesus did, how with his stripes we are healed, wounded transgressions, bruised for iniquities, chastised and peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. The stripes, what, what? But all the sickness and disease upon him. Sickness and disease was laid upon him for us to be healed. What was the blood of Jesus shed for, by the way? To for our deal with our sins, didn't it? it? Had nothing to do with our healing. It was the sickness and disease that was laid upon him that he bore away. So, important that we understand these are all false traditions. Every, also, people say, well, we can just always do something in the blood whenever we want. Do we do things in the blood or by the blood or with the blood? Never. How are we supposed to do everything in the Bible? Colossians 3, verse 17, we know we're supposed to walk in line with the word. It says, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. We do everything in the name of Jesus. That's what brings him on the scene, his authority, his power, manifesting himself. We pray in the name of Jesus, you know. We, everything we do is going to be through the name of Jesus, going through the high priestly ministry of Jesus. Here's another one. People say, well, I'm going to draw a bloodline around my property to protect me. People do that kind of stuff. Anybody do that in the Bible? No. What am I going to do? I'm going to send my angels all around the place, and they're the one is going to protect me. Very important. They say, well, I've got to draw this bloodline to be drawn for the protection of the, of, the, of the devil, and they say it's the same way that Rahab was protected from the devil, you know? But wait a minute. Was Rahab protected from the devil? No. Rahab's scarlet thread, scarlet thread protected her from what? God's judgment. It had nothing to do with the devil. Well, maybe it wasn't that, but how? Oh, Revel Exodus 12, this blood on the doorpost, it was protecting him from, the, from those enemies, Pharaoh and all those evil Egyptians. No, what was the blood protecting him from? God's judgment that was coming upon him. It has nothing to do with the enemy whatsoever. Well, people say, well, I'm just going to use the blood to resist the devil. Do I do that? No. How do I resist the devil? With the word of God, <coughs> speaking <coughs> the word of God, and... Uh, I'm with the authority that's been given unto me. You know, James 4, 7 says that we resist the devil and he'll flee from us. And we do this with authority that's been given unto us. And we resist him steadfast in the faith. So we don't do anything with the blood. We speak the word, we use the name of Jesus, and we do all the things that he says. But there's never do we say anything about the blood. We see another one down here where they say that this one, one particular person, this is a fairly well-known person uh, teaching on the blood of Jesus, wrote lots of books and popular speaker all over the country, says that the, the name, you can do things with a name or you can do things with the blood, they either want to work. That's what they say, kind of interchangeably. And they say, well, the name and the blood are not in competition with each other. You can use it either way, one of them. False. The blood does one thing and the name does another. The blood gets us right with God. The name takes dominion over the enemy and destroys his works as well as his prayers, the way we pray to receive from the Lord. They are not interchangeable. Do we see any place where every, anybody used the blood to conquer the enemy in any area? Never. 
We never see anything about it. Now, if the blood was so important for believers to use daily or do something with, wouldn't Jesus have taught about it? Is there anything in the New Testament and during Jesus' ministry where he taught about using the blood to cast out demons? Use the blood to receive the Holy Spirit. Use the blood in prayer. Use the blood to heal the sick. Use the blood, you know, in how you bear fruit. Use the blood in doing anything. Never. It's all false traditions of men. We do not do these kinds of things. What do we see? These are all unscriptural traditions of men. Instead, what is the truth? The truth is the blood of Jesus Christ is going to be applied by the Lord when we walk in the light as he is in the light and or when we have confessed our sins and received forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness. We conquer or overcome Satan's accusations because of the blood applied because we've met the conditions, which is walking in the light or having confessed our sins. Remember, it says that we overcome the enemy's accusations by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony, but not his works because they ended up being martyred. Important to understand this so that you don't fall for the unscriptural tradition of pleading the blood, covering everything with the blood. Instead, put your angels in operation. So if you're going to be successful, you're going to walk with God in line with his word and the blood will be applied by him. It all has to do with relationship with God. And then regarding the devil, you're going to use the word, you're going to use the name of Jesus, you're going to do things by the power of the spirit of God, and you are going to use that authority God's given to you, and you're going to conquer the enemy, whether it's cast him out or resist him or overcome him in, any, in some manner in your life. Unfortunately, because of this tradition, everybody out there in many Christian circles is wanting to plead the blood all the time. But unfortunately, it is a false tradition. So, if you've been doing it, if you can find chapter and verse, keep doing it. If you can't find chapter and verse, throw it out and eliminate it. What should you be doing? Put the angels to work. Start praying and putting the angels to work so that they're going to go before you to guard you, to protect you, to keep you, and to see God bring forth his promises in your life. Praise God. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you and praise you for the word of God, which is the truth. As we've looked at the word, we cannot see any place where anybody pleaded the blood in the Old Testament or New Testament. I understand the blood is not an off offensive weapon or a defensive weapon against the enemy. The blood involves our relationship with God. And the blood is applied by Jesus when we meet the conditions of walking in the light of the Word of God in which the blood automatically applied by Jesus keeps us continually cleansed from all sin so that Satan's accusations will not have effect also, the blood is applied when we have sinned, if we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I thank you, Lord. I'm going to be sure that the blood of Jesus is always applied by you in my life because I'm going to walk in the light as you're in the light, according to the word. If I sin, I will immediately confess my sin and receive forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness. I thank you, Lord, that I will overcome all of Satan's accusations by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of my testimony. I understand it doesn't stop his works. I have to use my authority in the name of Jesus and with the word of God and walking in line with his ways taking dominion through the mighty name of Jesus in order to conquer the works of the enemy. I understand completely this is a false tradition. I will get rid of this, and I will now put my angels in operation. I'm going to pray to the Father for him to send the angels forth. I'm going to speak forth the word, do the commandments of God, 
knowing the angels are going to hearken to it. They're going to go forth and minister for me, an heir of salvation. The angels will fight against the enemies in the realm of the spirit. They will protect me. They will keep me in all of my ways. I thank you, Lord, for the angels. They will minister for me because I'm an heir of salvation. And I'm going to see the angels working on my behalf continually. And any time I need help, just like Jesus did, he said, I could pray to my Father and he'd send all the angels necessary. I will do the same thing. I will pray to the Father and he, for him to send all the angels that are sufficient to deal with the situation to conquer the works of the enemy. Thank you, Lord, for the truth about the blood of Jesus and showing forth the unscriptural tradition of pleading the blood. I eliminate it. I will walk in the truth and I will see the blood continually applied in my life as I walk in line with the word. I understand it's between me and God. The blood is applied. Thank you, Lord, for the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Certainly an important teaching for the body of Christ so people aren't deceived and continue to do things that are unscriptural, thinking they're doing the right thing and not seeing any results. Now you might say, well, how about when people say they pleaded the blood and they saw all these results? Well, they must have done something that caused God's protection to be there for them. Perhaps they confessed the word. Perhaps they did pray for their angels to go forth. Or perhaps they were walking in the light and Satan's accusations were groundless and the enemy had, had no place to work against them anyway because they were walking in the light of the word of God. For some reason, the scriptural thing that they did, certainly, then God's protection was there. But one thing for sure, the unscriptural tradition of pleading the blood is not what did it. It has something else that caused them to be protected or not to have a problem or to be able to conquer and overcome in a situation. The Word of God is the truth. And one thing is for sure, every teaching out there, anything that a person believes, if we don't have chapter and verse for it, then we cannot receive it. We know it's not the truth. And of course, many people have said, well, if I don't plead the blood, what do I do? Why haven't people recognized that the angels are what does things for us? It's all over the Bible. You do a study on angels. You look at every scripture on angels throughout. You're going to see the angels doing all kinds of things. Messenger angels, warrior angels, protecting, guarding, fighting, smiting. In the book of Revelation, they're continually working and doing all kinds of things throughout the Word of God. So praise God. Put your angels to work. And God will work on your behalf to protect you in the earth. Father, thank you for all you brought forth. We will be hearers and doers of your word. We're going to get rid of this unscriptural tradition, and we will see the blood applied because we will meet the conditions of walking in the light and or confessing our sins to receive forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness. And we will put our angels in operation so that we will be protected and we will do the mighty works of the Lord and destroy the works of the enemy through the name of Jesus, the word of God, and by the power of the Holy Spirit as we see done in the word. Thank you for much fruit from this message as we hear and do it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God. Any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. If not, I hope it's been thoroughly taught.